Okay, well, hi folks, and welcome to the first Friends of Indian Art event of 2021. We are delighted to be producing events for our members again, and we hope everyone is well and safe. I'm Karen Freeman, and I'm a co-chair of Friends of Indian Art. Friends of Indian Art is a membership group that supports the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. Our mission is twofold to provide educational and cultural programs about Indian art and culture, and to purchase pieces of art for the museum's permanent collection. We work under the auspices of the Museum of New Mexico Foundation, who are kindly providing technical assistance for tonight's program. Thank you so much. If you are interested in learning more about FIA and our activities, please look online at museumfoundation.org slash friends and drill down to the Friends of Indian Art page. Now for tonight's event, a few of my favorite things. I am delighted to introduce Tony Chavarria, a member of Santa Clara Pueblo and the curator of ethnology at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. Um, Prior to his being curator of ethnology, Tony served as cultural exhibit consultant for a number of prestigious institutions. He also served as the community liaison and curator for the inaugural, inaugural, I can say that, Pueblo exhibition at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC. He has been at MIAC for 24 years. He started as a little bitty kid um, and he still finds items in the collections that amaze him from both the past and the present. Just so you know, some of the items you'll be seeing tonight have not been seen by the public for more than 20 years. So Tony, I'm gonna to turn it over to you and we'll have a Q and A session after Tony's presentation and then we'll see how it goes. Thank you, Karen. I just wanted to also thank um, the friends and the foundation too for all their help in getting this together. And I'm gonna uh, attempt to share my screen and get this going. And hopefully that's now sharing. <laughs> okay. And um, so, yeah, so, so a few of my favorite things. Um, it's uh, when you're asked to do that, you know, um, sometimes people ask, you know, what is your most favorite thing in the collections? And um, sometimes you have something that kind of like pops up very, com you know, very frequently. And many times there are things that you just, uh, you see, and all of a sudden you just become very in enchanted by it and kind of like sticks in your mind and um you see other things too and you you, uh, you think to yourself you know one day i'm going to use that you know either in a program or an exhibition and that's often how that happens to me you know very often so when i was asked to pick up a few of uh, my favorites um so i came up with an initial list and i thought well i'll do like a five and talk you know, a little bit longer on each, each piece uh but then um i uh, changed it so actually uh so it's a little even different from the preview that we did earlier because I had some, uh, a couple more things. Um, and it just says this one really quickly, just because uh, I didn't have enough time to put uh, the other uh, images in there, but this has always been one of my favorites um, in the museum is what we call the fat deer, the fat elk, um, this Cochiti figurine from about 1890. And um, he had a missing top snout. Um, so he looked him like kind of very odd and um, it was, uh, gosh, probably about 18 years ago now, or maybe even longer, um, we worked with conservation and they worked with um, a, a Cochiti potter to uh, come up with the proper snout to rebuild him so he could get his smile back. And so ever since then, he's been one of my favorites. And I don't have the right image, but he actually even has a line break that goes down uh, through his back. So he is very, very traditional chubby deer. And although he has very moose-like antlers. Let's get into some of the other pieces. This is a piece, this is a wallopie um, wedding dress and or cape. 
uh, basically kind of like listed as a cape, but sometimes it's a dress. This was collected by Alfred Krober um, in the 1930s uh, among, from the Wallapai and had been in the Maya collections. And uh, we got a call a couple of years ago um, from a, a woman in the language department for the Wallapai uh, tribe. And she asked if we could, they could come see the objects that Alfred Krober had um, collected um, and that she had seen them before. And as she described it as actually when they were still in the lab, um, I guess you said she had, they had last visited about like 1992 or 93. So this is you know, like in 2017 and she um, came to see, uh, they, they brought a group to see the pieces. So many of them were elderly and we brought out all the pieces of, uh, thanks to uh, help um, uh, from everyone, from Lisa, Ross, um, Amy, and we had things spread out you know, throughout the collections area. And it was very, very emotional to see some of the things that they were, they were talking about. And I would ask questions sometimes, I'd try to be quiet. Sometimes uh, just things got the best, better if you know to ask things. Um, sometimes, you know, I thought, I thought maybe it was in the wrong moment. Um, well, but, but when it came to this piece, which was one of the last ones we got to, everyone was very, very, very um, excited about this piece because this type of um, a cape is used in the traditional wedding ceremony there and um, there are still a couple of uh, uh, versions of it there at, at Wallapai. However, they're um, not in the best of shape and the one that is in the best shape is used over and over again. Someone said they, they you know, guessed that it was used in approximately 20, 25 weddings there. So they, were, they saw this piece and they're hoping that to be able to um, be able to duplicate it as well. And so it's made out of buckskin um, with, with paint and um, we're hoping eventually, you know, when uh, things calm down and uh, we can get some uh, funding, we maybe we can get a grant and we would like to, to actually take some of the, those pieces that they looked at out there so even more community members could see them. And then, uh, then they could also start working on making the uh, duplicate of this piece. Uh, and so when the uh, people were here, uh, they were, I was asking a question and they said, um, oh, hold on a minute. The, uh, other woman is looking at a piece and she's, uh, she's uh, basically talking to it. And she was telling the, the pieces here that they were very happy to see them again and that they are glad that they're being taken care of and that they hope that they, they served a purpose for them and they hope to continue to continue to, that they will still help the, the, the wall of pie and maybe in another, in another form. And I thought that was very special. So this is another one that came in. Uh, so yeah, like 2001. And this is a, one of my favorites. You know, it's like about a six by eight textile. It's huge. Um, and so yeah, the last time it was on exhibit was in the new acquisitions case, the big old glass one that used to be in the lobby of Mayak that Dennis and I put in there on a slight slant board and it took up the entire case. Um, but um, we've always like really liked this piece um, showing the the lunar landing, you know, on the the moon landing, and uh, you know, depicting it, you know, in textiles. So you know, you can't do you know round things. So you know, everything has a kind of like a Atari twenty six hundred style graphics. So you got like this eight bit you know type of uh, transfer to uh, textile. That's something that's very traditional, but also looks uh, you could say very very um, uh, retro as well. But again, this is another one I've always really liked and um, hopefully one day we can get it back out um, because they get this a giant, giant piece. So as we're going like other talking about other things, you know, so sometimes, you know, when you looking at things, they're, um, they're a favorite because of, you know, they're, uh, they're impressive, they're a favorite because um, the artist that made that, um, but other, there are other reasons too, why something is like, you know, that I find uh, intriguing or this becomes a, a, a favorite of mine. And right now, this is one of these. This is a bracelet uh, by Rick Manuel. This is a, a recent gift. Um, it just came in a couple of years ago. And um, so this one reminds me of um, Angela Joaquin Jr., uh, our late um, member of our advisory panel. And he's a co-curator of the um, sections on the, the renovations for the Here Now and Always exhibit. And you know, so he passed recently. You know, uh, 
due to COVID. And so I remember when we were interviewing him for the exhibit and talking about things, um, he brought this, a friend of his uh, approached him and he brought this piece to us to accession it so it could go into the exhibit. And it depicts some um, uh, Wyla band. So it's a Wyla band, you know, playing and uh, in the desert, you know, in this, in the, in the moonlight. You can see the stars, you know, the mountains in the background, the people on the, the side there dancing in the band, which uh, I should point out, as Angelo pointed out, is an acoustic band. Because um, as he said, that some of his uh, fondest memories is these bands playing, you know, all night long, because he says, you know, you, the traditional Wyla dances weren't during the day because it was too hot. You know, so they were during the night when it was when things cooled down and that people would um, uh, uh, dance to these uh, acoustic wireless bands. And as he said, they, um, they would play uh, different tempos and that people, what he would say, glide, glide along the desert, as he put it. And he, would, um, uh, he hopes that, uh, that some bands will kind of go, go towards that again. Um, he said, because, uh, because many of them again are electrified. So it's a much more powerful, you know, big sound. Um, and he would like to see some of them like go for that more older acoustic sound and that the dancers aren't as energetic, but again, but that gliding, that gliding technique he would like to see. So, um, so this one here, I picked this one because yeah, except right now it reminds me of Angelo. And um, uh, it's kind of like, you know, when, um, you know, when I, when, I, when I lost my parents too, you realize, you know, how sometimes you feel, you know, you lost in a way because you wish you could have asked them things that, you're not able to now. And same with like with Angelo, we were trying to have him um, record something that he had written uh, that we thought was very fitting for the exhibition and we weren't able to do that. And they were, even at SAR, they were trying to do a, it was kind of like a program that was in the, that was basically a mini tribute to him as well. And uh, that wasn't able to happen because of the COVID. And then we, then we lost him. So uh, it's, it's a big loss. And, um, you know, I still think about him um, very much and I hope that, um, it's over, we can bring his partner Anne out and um, do a proper um, a tribute and memorial to him sometime. This is another, again, favorite when it came in, uh, a recent one. This, uh, this bowl, this water bowl by Lonnie V. Hill, um, this mica bowl, and it's, in, it's this amazing, beautiful piece. Um, as many of you know, little Lonnie, he is a, uh, Lycaceous potter and he uh, fires, you know, outdoors. And so you can see those fire clouds on the bottom of the jar. Again, they're the bowls and the, the pieces are generally fired upside down, excuse me. And you can see his, uh, the, the trademark fire clouds. And I think it's, it's actually it's telling, it's showing something how fire is represented in a form. Um, I was watching that uh, uh, Netflix glass show where they were tasked to do something about fire and how do you depict fire? Um, and then I thought this is actually one of the best ways to do that because you know with those fire clouds it just shows that being touched by fire and and uh, lack of oxygen. So you get to get those marks, you know, which are completely random but you know beautiful at the same time. And they just add they add to the piece. You know, besides his you know his mastery of form and the, the shaping you know the, the waves and how they can be read, you know, positive and negatively as well. So it's a, it's an incredible piece, you know, it's this bowl which can hold water, but is also referencing water as well. And uh, it's again, one of his, you know, he has, he's done so many amazing works. And this is uh, another one that he has. Um, it's a, it's funny because he's largely, you know, self-taught and he started doing work, you know, basically very late after he retired from his uh, Washington DC job and he came back and then deciding what he was wanted to do and how he was going to make a living. And he just kind of like heard the calling, you know, of the clay, the clay mother, and just started doing the work. And um, and it just, you know, he just, his hands, you know, went to the clay and the clay went to him. And he still, you know, can, still does this work. And um, it's uh, always a, you know, a, a privilege to have him around and be able to talk to him about his, his, his views on, art and life and just how he lives. This one is just because it reminds me of my grandmother. 
Um, my grandmother, Frances Cheveria, she was a potter. Uh, she was born in Numbe and then married my grandfather and moved to uh, Santa Clara. Uh, she, she was a potter you know, all her life. You know, she learned she was very young. Um, and then, uh, so she would make, you know, all different types of pieces and including some occasionally, you know, water jars. And um, she um, had this old um, uh, underdress that, you know, often people wear this underdress and then the manta over it. And she had this very old um, uh, underdress that was very um, uh, uh, Victorian kind of turn of the century with a very high necked collar that kind of flared out. And um, so sometimes this kind of reminds me of her of that, and that, that collar and that dress. As you can see of this one of this classic um, uh, black Oya um, with the uh, flared rim and then this, this type of undulations or what they call it sometimes called a pie crust rim. And um, it's one of these those pieces, you know, too. So it's not um, painted, you know, it's just, just as the, um, uh, the reduction, you know, to trim black. So the piece has to kind of like stand out in different ways, you know, with its polishing, with the, the form and the features on there and the texture. And so it's, it's those who it made that period too, where they're still being made for use, but there's, they're starting going to this area, they're being made for sale. And, you know, that they were, were already being collected, you know, from the, about the 1860s, 1870s, and then um, been constantly after that. So this is one that, uh, you know, the, so it's kind of like very kind of Victorian. So some people say, you know, it kind of looks like someone in a corset as well. And so it's one of those classic, um, uh, Oyas that you see that you know just makes you think you know um, those Tewa villages, particularly Santa Clara. This is another of my favorites. This always has been. It's very beat up. It's not in the best of shape. The painting is faded, but it's, it's yeah. Because in a way, it's like me. We I mean, were showing our age as <laughs> we're sort of going on. Um, this is it was in the uh, earlier H and A. And again, when I first saw it, again, I just loved it. Um, you could see the uh, the turtle design, you know, very faintly on there. It's like what's it was it's what you could call a turtle back canteen, and so they rightly painted this really nice turtle right on top of it, and it looks like it's a red-eared slider too. You can actually tell what kind of turtle, and um, the uh, the different type of um, knobs on the side. You can see the one is broken there on the left. And it still has the uh, lacing, the hide lacing on there. And then on the back, and which is what you couldn't see when it was on exhibit, is this frog. So these different ele these uh, elements of the, the beings that live in the water, live with water, um, and which again being so important in this this water canteen. And so you can see also see the knob where it also helps hang. You know, you tie it to each side, and then on the right is um, the side is broken. Um, but again, so this again, this really just lovely, lovely, you know, quickly painted frog on here. And then on the sides, there's the serpent. So you can, so on the side of it, it wraps around and his, his tail and his head meet near the top aperture. So you can see on the left there is his head. Um, you can kind of see his horn and the plumes that he's wearing around his neck. So that specific serpent for Zuni people. And then also from this, this profile view, you can see why they call it a turtleback canteen. And then this kind of like very subtle, like almost pinkish color from the slip has always been, it's always very it's intrigued me. Um, I would like to, uh, to make one like this someday, but it would be a lot of work. Hentings are very, very hard. So this is also a newer piece. Um, this is in the Don Pierce bequest. Um, I really like this, uh, this bracelet um, by Kelly Morgan. Again, so it's, you know, she's using both of them. It's just the cutting and to create the um, a step, you know, and cloud motifs around it, um, again, which is very nice because it's also referencing the turquoise. As you, some of you may remember from Hexine's exhibit, you know, that of the refer references earth, water, you know, with the sky as well. And then with the, uh, the nice inclusions also in the stone. Um, and then that very fine um, uh, stamp work, you know, and just the bar motifs in between. 
the cloud rotates. So this is something that too is like, oh, this is really nice. So I would, um, sometimes when uh, we look at things like, I would say, say I have a tendency to pick the odd, odd things or kind of all weird things. And uh, this is what I hope is that something that uh, is different, but also very pleasing to other folks as well. So I had a different manta in my earlier check, but then I was also going through and I found this one and I said, oh wait, I, I like this one. So I pulled this one out. This is a, you know, an old um, Akuma Hopi manta. I remember um, talking about this um, with some other researchers and I think uh, it's basically if people are deciding it's uh, about 60, 70%, you know, leaning towards um, Akuma and then the possibly Hopi, but yeah, I'm, Pretty much I'm sure that this is probably an Akama piece. Um, it's, it's again it's amazing to look at this, I mean, especially when you start looking at it like, in, like a little on focused, and you can see how that brilliant play of the, um, the bottom embroidery, where the um, negative and the positive space work with each other to create those some of the designs for the clouds, either you know either uh, steps or you know, things going up, but also coming down into the piece and then the um, other negative work within the embroidery inside there. This is one of the pieces that um, Mara, you know, used in one of his, his uh, illustrations of the Pueblo embroidery book. So uh, it's, it's an amazing piece and that would also makes it uh, a little unusual too is those other motifs, which are usually um, interpreted as birds that are above the top of the embroidery band. And so here's a kind of a close up view of that. So you can see some of that, that yarn, which is probably more green and is faded a lot there. And then, but um, it's then also with the black uh, embroidery to make those sort of designs. Um, so you can see there's some loss of the uh, embroidery, but it's held up, you know, pretty good for uh, being uh, used, as you can see, as, as used, and then being in a museum for good part of a century. So this is another one, uh, a newer piece that again, when it came in, I thought I thought was darling. And so I was hoping to use it. Um, this is a, a tiny beaded figurine of a Navajo code talker. Uh, you may have seen them when they're doing uh, their events and social gatherings and the co-talkers, you know, this is kind of like their, their modern uniform of like the, the uh, that yellow or gold um, uh, uh, ribbon shirt, you know, and then uh, they'll wear their, um, uh, their uh, caps and um, then their jewelry, you know, with that. And so this is a little tiny figure, you can see he's barely two and a half inches um, high and uh, but um, so I thought it's just like a really neat depiction of a, a co-talker. So um, especially when you see like little like beadwork projects like this, um, it was a toss between I was going to use this one or this other bag that it has a uh, beaded uh, letters on it that says I dig Elvis. So um, but I had used that one before and uh, so I thought I'll pull this one out, which is a newer that many people haven't seen yet, although it is in El Pal, the recent El Pal. But this is one that I hope that uh, uh, we'll be able to use and the renovations from here now and always again to help uh, give up uh, an object to help talk about the co-talkers and their uh, their use of language, you know, for uh, to develop that code and, uh, you know, when it, especially after a time when the, the use of language, you know, in schools was frowned upon, but being able to use it to uh, defend their country, even though, again, that they were being uh, told not to. And oh, so that is the last one there. But I did just want to say, let me stop the share. And uh, again, just say that, uh, that many of these things that we have in the collections, like every day, when you go downstairs, it's there can be always something new, there's always something that catches your eye that you want to do. I, um, 
there are um, a lot of um, paintings and works on paint that I that I really like and um, that you always think about something that you can do with um, some things we, we've been able to uh, there's not there were these other uh, that you may have seen uh, the paintings by Awad Sira that depict um, uh, Kushari's and Santa Claus that we were able to do the Christmas cards from with pomegranate um, so things like that um, we were there the uh, things that we did again with Robert Tenorio and <laughs> we were going to have the big um, uh, the uh, event with him uh, that was going to be on uh, gosh I think it was April 2nd or something last year <laughs> and, but then then everything changed and so that I so that there's so it is it's a very unusual time it's kind of like um, you know we're, we're uh, we work to um, help you know tell stories with the pieces and you know and take care of them and try you know and uh, interpret them or, or present them and we do that you know uh, uh, we try to do that but like now just this is the kind of the cause of separation not only from you know the kind of like work things but even like family and certainly with community and so many of the communities have been hit so hard with these pieces that uh, excuse me with the the, the virus that um, it's I know that you know it's going to be a while until we kind of kind of get to to cope with things because of how many people that have, we've lost. I mean, as the year's gone on, there's been so many people that um, it's, it's really reflective of like the past pandemic in 1918 or at back home, people talk about that and how you lost this one gener almost entire generation of men um, because of what happened. And, and how, and how long it kind of took to recover. And this is kind of the same way, except it's not um, you know, this younger generation, it's just all these elders, these elders that, you know, that you, you, you're losing and, and losing, you know, too fast. And so I'm hoping, you know, again, so hoping and praying that things continue to get better and that, um, that we will have um, a, a good, good times ahead. And, uh, but again, so again, thanks to the friends, thanks to the foundation for letting me be able to share some of my favorites with you. Tony, thank you so much. Virtual clapping. Um, can you just, I'm sure everybody is curious, there is not a buzzsaw in your room. It's the wind, right? That's- Yes, that is the wind. That's the wind. It's hitting the vent on the roof, you know, which comes down. Um, it's, an, it's an old house. Uh, it's like built in the 40s, so it's not, um, a, you know, it wouldn't be up to code today. So the vent, you know, goes in this, this uh, little center area where the uh, furnace is, which is in the, the crawl space. So, you know, so the furnace like burns, blows up onto this big grate that takes up that whole little center space. So you have to like jump over it when the heater is on. Otherwise, you would literally like burn your feet and leave a big waffle imprint. <laughs> so there's that, and then when that gets going, that knocks. And so I was in like another Zoom talk before, and it was just like bang, bang, bang. So I was like, "What is that?" I said, "Oh, sorry, that's me." Uh, but yeah, then then other ways from the top, you know, then it's the the vent that is that makes it sound like that someone's running a, a chainsaw behind me. <laughs> okay, well, we just wanted to make sure there was no you know serial killer in your background. No, no, not today. Okay, <laughs> um, but we do have almost half an hour for questions. Um, I would invite people to either use the chat function at the bottom of your screen and you can type a question or um, Carolyn has offered to help me survey people. And if you raise your hand, we'll try to call on you and then you have to unmute yourself. We cannot unmute you to ask your question. So um, we will take questions, but I'm really bad at finding people with raised hands. Oh, wait, there's Bruce. Okay. Hi, Bruce. How, howdy. Uh, Tony, just an aside on the uh, Lonnie V. Hill piece. Uh, he was the uh, uh, guest artist at uh, SAR and did a very similar piece. And uh, Bob and uh, Carol really uh, liked it and uh, commissioned him to do another. And it took four years for him to make one without it breaking. And so the one you see is the result of four to five years of patience. 
That's great perspective, Bruce. Thank you. Okay. Artists. So that's sort of, I have sort of a follow up on the Lonnie piece. Um, would he have coiled just a round pot and then carved those waves out or were each of the waves created with their own little coils up to the point? No, he probably would have cut them out. Okay. Um, you know, he, would, uh, he actually probably could have like coiled up all the way and then started like shaping those things out, you know, as the moving clay, you know, after okay. it was formed. Yeah, and, and Lonnie too, he doesn't let anyone watch him fire as well because, because you know, again, that, you know, he doesn't want to, to change how the piece may or may not come out. That, uh, that uh, it's all up to him. So that he, he, just, he just, doesn't, just doesn't like people who would want to like watch him fire. He's like, no, no, you know, I have to be by myself. I have to do it. Or he has some of his trusted um, helpers and some of his relatives that will help him. So. Thank you. Joanne Balzer is asking if any of these pieces that you showed will be in the new Here, Now, and Always. Yes, uh, the two I can think of immediately um, are the, um, the co-talker, the little beaded figurine, and also the Wyla Band um, uh, bracelet, the overlay by um, uh, Rick Manuel. Um, he, he, and so he is um, uh, Ma Akimil, um, Odom and also Tono Odom. So both of them are bands. Um, the uh, desert people, river people, I think I, or I guess the other way around, river people, desert people. And, um, and he's a, a self-taught silversmith. And um, so, so that was kind of like nice to be able to get, you know, a work from, a, a, or so that we can expand the representation from uh, the different tribes in the Southwest. I have a question from uh, Rob Lucas. Uh, he asked, do you think we will be seeing new kinds of art or different themes as a result of the pandemic? Yes, yes, I think so. And it's already being reflected in um, even how what museums are doing right now, um, that I think that the, that they could, it could be, you know, um, a, a way of looking at things, even just how um, things changed even after the last pandemic. Um, that there was, you know, you, you saw sometimes like these, these bursts of innovation. And also, I think um, there will also maybe be this uh, uh, neo-traditionalism that might also might happen. The uh, idea, and because of, you know, just like when you think of what happened, you know, even in, in uh, um, America, you know, after the pandemic too, you know, what happened during the 20s and that development of, you know, that, uh, that even new types of literature and such. That, uh, that I think that's what could happen, I think in the, many of the native communities because of uh, what happened you know, here. And I think of how people, you know, that there's, there's right now, there's, there's, we're so distant from our um, uh, traditions and our practices right now that I think uh, people will now appreciate that, you know, even more and you know, hopefully hold on to them even more closely as we're, you know, being able to get a more and more past the virus that um, the, certainly the dances and then even even simple things like um, uh, birthdays, you know, that now basically it's a, uh, I know uh, at Santa Clara, it's basically like they do these drive-bys. Basically they, <laughs> the kids will sit on the porch and people will drive by and wish them happy birthday, you know, such too. Um, that, uh, and as I just said, it makes me wonder too, is that, like, you know, like what will happen, especially like the, the, the these, younger kids as they grow up, you know, what, 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 what will they do? What will they make? Because it is, it's, it's, just, it's really a, a changing, I think a, it's a different experience with this, these younger kids and about what um, we, you know, what we were able to do and, uh, but now, you know, when you can't, when you can't celebrate birthdays, when you have to stay away from, you know, your grandparents, um, you know, or um, sometimes because you're living with your grandparents because, you know, you, you're going to have, you know, the parent, you've lost a parent or something that, that I think, yeah, that's, there's things will be, will be represented in all these changes will be represented in the art and different things, activities, but it just kind of like remains to be seen. And it, you know, it's going to go, go on for a couple of generations. There's a question from the Hootkins. 
Can you tell us a bit more about the band on the bracelet? And, and I have an add-on question. You used a term for that band that I'm not familiar with. Oh, Can sure. Yeah, yeah. Yes, um, good point. Yeah. So it's a Wyla band, Wyla, W-A-I-L-A, Wyla. And sometimes in the past it was called Chicken Scratch. Chicken <laughs> Scratch music, Wyla music. And it's the type of music that was, um, a, it's very um, a German influenced. Um, you know, they had, a, again, because they had the, the brass section, the two saxophones, and um, you know, the, the drums, uh, guitars, violins. And um, so it very sounds like some, sometimes kind of like almost like a Norteño music as well. Um, but when you listen closely, you know, it's very distinctive. So yeah, so it's this type of um, music. It's a uh, native music that is very, very distinctive because it doesn't sound like of what you would typically think is native music. You know, it's not a flute, you know, and uh, or and or a drum, and um, uh, and chants or not too, but it, it's um it's, it's very very um uh, in a sense um uh, poppy and um and when you when you do hear it you do feel like um uh, dancing um as uh, Angelo said once that uh and it's and it's not you know and it's not you know very um uh, super energetic as well you know it's because again you're in the desert so you you take these very like nice um uh, smooth steps. And as you move your partner around, and uh, um, uh, and again, as you mentioned, Susie, who was always like very wanted to point out, but in different tempos. He says nowadays the band just play all up tempos, but no, they should be in multiple tempos, including slow ones as well. So, but yeah, so while the music, our chicken scratch is a, it's a very um a, still um, a vibrant um, a music form, and um, the there's still a, a while festival that it takes place there. I know Angelo is running one of them as well uh, because his uh, father was part of, there were the Joaquin brothers, uh, this uh, famed Wyla band uh, that they played at uh, Madison Square Garden. And um, so that when the, he, well, uh, Angelo grew partly up in uh, California uh, because of, you know, during the, um, the termination period when people were working in a lot of the uh, cities that had you know, the, the jobs were there, they're being sent there. And he said there was this big um, uh, um, in a Odom community um, in California um, and uh, they would get together and they would form bands. And uh, he said there were also like other native, native uh, people there too. So they would always get together, you know and have these types of activities. And then a band, you know, they would start playing music, start jamming and then and the, pretty soon, you know, a dance would break out. So, so he remembers um, uh, like uh, just all these uh, band members just love sleeping on the floor of his house when he was young. So. Okay. Do we have any other questions for Tony? Okay, well, Tony, thank you so much for a terrific presentation. Um, again, everybody's clapping. Thank you. Um, our next Friend of, Friends of Indian Art event is April 22nd. We will have a panel discussion with Daryl and Rebecca Begay and their son, Robert Whitehair Begay, who is the 2020 Goodman Aspiring Artist Fellowship Award winner. The May event will be May 20th and we will be giving a virtual tour of the new exhibit, Clearly Indigenous, curated and guided by Dr. Leticia Chambers. This exhibit uh, showcases glass as a native art form. So we thank you all very much for your participation. Please stay safe. Yay, green, but we nil, still need to be safe and careful. Yeah, and, great job, New Mexico. <laughs> yeah, and we will see you virtually on April 22nd. So thank you.